from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Thanks for listening. Eric Atkinson here. First up today, K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney is joined by Oklahoma State University's David Lawman as they'll talk about individual beef cow efficiency in the breeding herd. They'll define what constitutes efficiency and look at management approaches to improving that. Following then, K-State's Rich Llewellyn. He'll look at the latest K-State projections on ARC and PLC farm program payments for 2019 and 20 crop production based in part on the USDA's just released grain price forecasts. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd reports on several landscape and garden insects to be aware of right now. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome once again to another Agriculture Today. And for openers, something for you cow-calf producers. A glance at cow efficiency. That could be assessed in several ways, as we hear in the following conversation. It's part of the weekly podcast hosted by K-State Beef Systems Specialist Jamie Lynn Farney. Her podcast goes by the handle of Dr. J's Beef. And this time, Jamie Lynn taps the expertise of Oklahoma State University Extension Beef Cattle Specialist David Lawman, who has conducted extensive work in this area of gaining efficiencies in cow-calf production. Dave, what is your definition of cow efficiency? So from a, from a broad perspective, uh, cow efficiency could be defined on an economic basis as cost per unit of revenue generated. Then if we look at it from a biological standpoint, it might be viewed as uh, units of input per units of productive output. Most producers would uh, maybe fine tune that definition from and focused on the cow calf enterprise and include, you know, something like uh, a female that has uh, requires low inputs. And those inputs would be, you know, include things like uh, docility and utter quality structure and so on, so that you don't have utter problems and lameness and uh, you don't have docility issues. All those kind of hassle factor things would be a piece of that efficiency component. And then obviously reproductive efficiency or fertility, and that's going to be extremely important in any cow efficiency equation. Uh, But then uh, beyond those things, there would be the feed cost per unit of production. And that's the area that our group here at Oklahoma State is focused more on is the, uh, you might consider it to be the, the nutritional efficiency or energetic efficiency of cows. And in regards to some of that energetic efficiency of your cows, do you have any general rules of thumbs or some things that you're consistently finding across your research that comes to the forefront? There are a few, yes. Uh, You know, I think we've learned that we knew going in that it was a complex uh, question or area to study, and and most definitely it is. So uh, to summarize that, uh, we have learned a lot and continue to. In fact, I think we've just viewed the tip of the iceberg as far as, you know, the opportunity to improve cow efficiency. Um, you know, one thing that we have have learned over time, I guess, is that there's just in terms of, let's just say, forage utilization efficiency or forage intake per unit of milk production or per unit of calf production. The thing we've learned over time there 
Jamie Lynn, is that in any group of cattle that cows we have studied, there's a wide, wide range in that efficiency number. And, you know, you get to utilize some really neat technology to come up with those uh, efficiency numbers. What kind of tools do you use to determine that? We have been very fortunate to be able to uh, install some technology that you could describe as individual feed intake system for cows or cattle that are grouped cows or maintained in groups, right? So so we're just using a pin system. So it'd be a little bit like a, a large feedlot pin with a group of cows in it. And we measure individual hay or mixed ration intake. There are several of those uh, products on the market now, those intake systems. So we've, we've modified one that better suits our uh, our goal or focus on forage utilization efficiency. So most of our measurements are are taken by measuring actual long stem hay consumption. Uh, and so that that makes it a little bit unique and yes it's uh, uh, it's been a very nice addition to our research program. And, you know, you mentioned that you kind of look at intake on a pin basis, but if a producer was looking to try and quantify some efficiency in his cattle operation, what would you say he could do in there or he or she could do in their operation? So, I mean, that's a challenge still because we're, we're kind of at the research stage to try to identify or figure out how to better identify cows that consume a lot of feed and cows that consume a smaller amount of feed per unit of body weight. And like I said, that variation is very wide. So producers really at this point in time, unless you go to a lot of cost and uh, just investment, it would be it would be difficult to do that. You could do a feed intake study like we do on cows on, on about any farm if you're willing to go out and purchase that technology. Most people aren't going to do that. One of the things that we're doing is trying to find ways to identify these cows in a more in a rapid fashion uh, using some sort of a, a metabolic marker or gas emissions or something like that. And that's one of our goals. But Jamie Lynn, just to give you an example, I I mentioned the variation that we find in any group of cows. One set of cows we tested last year, we calculated their average annual forage consumption. And just as an example, we had one cow that produced about a 600 pound calf winning weight. Actually, it was 608 pound adjusted calf winning weight. And her average annual forage intake was 45 pounds of long stem forage a day. Another cow in the same contemporary group weaned about a 550 pound calf, but she only consumed about 20 pounds of forage on an average a daily basis. Uh, so tremendous differences there. You know, if you think about that, uh, if you had a I know it's an extreme example, but if you had a thousand of the cows that consume 45 pounds, you could should be able to run 2,000 of the cows that only consume 20 pounds on the same operation. It's interesting, the cow that consumed 45 pounds, she gave a lot of milk. Uh, she gave average 33 pounds of milk production and actually had a hard time maintaining her body condition, which you would expect. For a cow that gives that much milk. The other cow only gave about 17 pounds of milk a day, and she was an easy flesher, which again, you probably would expect, but it's surprising that she only had to consume 20 pounds of forage and was still able to maintain her body condition. You know, and on your milk, because you've went ahead and brought that out, I've seen some of your data that shows some of the efficiency of cow intake to milk production to calf weaning weight. Is that a really efficient system or is it pretty variable? It's quite variable. Um, I can tell you this, the better the forage quality is during lactation, the lower the efficiency of conversion of milk to calf weight gain. The lower the quality of forages during lactation, the better. Because, uh, yeah, and so let's say a fall calving system where you've got possibly 
senescent forage through the winter and lower quality forage, the conversion of milk is actually pretty good. Milk to calf gain is pretty good. Uh, the problem is, is supplying the cow with enough nutrients to produce all that milk and and that can be expensive. Uh, some of the other research that I've seen from you um, about looking at the crossbred heifer versus a straight bred Angus. Are you starting to see any trends observed in that crossbred versus the straight bred? So yeah, we we looked at that combination thinking that uh, there are several experiments have been published that show that the Hereford breed uh, has lower intake in growing animals, lower intake on average. Uh, And so we thought, well, you know, with uh, a lot of the Angus cattle having higher genetics for post-winning performance, higher genetics for milk yield and so on, the Hereford breed might actually be considered complementary to the Angus breed in terms of in a cow-calf operation, lowering the average annual forage intake. And in fact, in one study that we uh, recently published, the average annual forage intake was about two pounds a day lower in the crossbred cows. That's a little bit of a surprise because, you know, you think when you crossbreed, you're going to get the uh, heterosis effect, which actually slightly increases production probably, well, most of the publications say that the heterosis effect actually increases forage intake. Uh, But we think that the breed complementarity is strong enough uh, that it actually, you know, it it sort of offsets uh, the bump in heterosis that you get and actually reduce their daily forage intake by two pounds a day. So it was a way for, you know, uh, ranching environments that might have lower quality forage or tougher conditions, if you will, a way to look at that or to reduce input costs in the cow-calf enterprise. Along with K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney, that's Extension Beef Cattle Specialist out of Oklahoma State University, David Lawman. That's just part of their discussion of cow herd deficiency. Be sure to catch the entire podcast. Search for Dr. J's Beef or you can link to it from Jamie Lynn's page at southeast.ksu.edu. We'll be back shortly on Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network. Well, a time or two this week, we've been referencing that USDA supply and demand report which came out and it did include updated projections on grain prices important information when you think about the calculations for the price support mechanisms as part of the usda farm program the agricultural risk coverage and price loss coverage options that you producers chose from for your farm program payments We're visiting now with Rich Llewellyn. He's an Extension Associate in the K-State Department of Agricultural Economics, and he has been maintaining the information that you producers can utilize in figuring out your likely payments from those programs considering these prices. Well, tell us what USDA came out with as you plug the new numbers in, if you would, Rich. Well, for the current year, the payment that's going to be made in October, there weren't a whole lot of changes. Uh, We're getting very close to the end of the market year, and so uh, those prices remain pretty much the same. Uh, The wheat price actually has already been determined, and so there will be a $0.92 PLC payment on that. We still have less than a month to go on the uh, corn and grain sorghum and soybean prices, and it's pretty clear that we'll have no payment on soybeans for uh, this payment in October. These are for the crops that were harvested in 2019. Mm -hmm. We will have a payment for grain sorghum, and it'll be the largest. Uh, That'll be around 65 cents, give or take. USDA 
came up a few cents, and it's about the same as the K-State estimate also. Corn is going to be between 10 and 13 cents, probably. It could vary a penny when they come out with the final amounts, but that's pretty firm too. Uh, So those didn't change a whole lot. What changed more in this last report was looking ahead to the crops that are harvested this year where the payment will be made in in, uh, 2021. And right to that then, the numbers that were included to give a hint as to those projected 2021 payments, what did they say? Well, soybeans, again, will likely have no PLC payment, and uh, USDA actually raised their uh, estimated prices for soybeans for the next marketing year quite a bit, uh, over $9, and we've seen, you know, the futures prices heading up here, and so that's not a real surprise. But uh, the other crops are going to, at this point, looking like they'll have uh, PLC payments Similar to what we had this last year, uh, wheat may be even a little more than the 92 cents. Corn is in the 10 to 20 cent range for PLC payments. And then grain sorghum, there's a bigger variation there. USDA raised their uh, projected grain sorghum price for the next marketing year up to 350, uh, which is significantly higher than it had been and higher than it was for this last year. Those are projections looking considerably forward, actually. Mm -hmm. The USDA, does it tend to, and this is general, Rich, but tend to very much from these kinds of projections as we move along? Do these fluctuate all that much? In normal years, no, they wouldn't. This year, it's it's quite unusual. Just in this last report, uh, prices did jump as much as they did. The projection previously for corn had been uh, for uh, under $3, and they jumped it up to 350 we could see more changes yet. K-State will be having some estimates coming along in another month. I expect they will fall in with about where USDA is right now. All right. Of course, we concentrate here on the price loss coverage option. Uh, the ARC program, well, enrollment may not have been as robust there, but any information on that side of it that you can share? It's The reason we talk about PLC is because it's so easy to calculate. Uh, the ARC program uh, depends not only on price, but also on county yield, which we don't know for sure. We do have some maps on the agmanager.info website that give some idea using RMA and uh, national ag statistics data, Uh, but we won't actually know the final county yields until they're announced next month. But just looking at it, uh, the wheat price would have needed to be below 487 with an average yield. So just assuming an average yield in a county, and the wheat price was below that. So for wheat and then also for grain sorghum, counties with average yields will receive some ARC payment. Now, if your yield was higher, that would either lower it or eliminate it. Uh, If you have below average yields, then wheat and grain sorghum definitely would have ARC payments. So it just totally depends on what the county yield was for that crop in that county. For corn and for uh, soybeans, you would have to have yields in the county that are well below the average yield. The corn price would have needed to go below 318, and it didn't even really come close to that. Soybeans, same way, it never got down to where an average yield would give an ARC County payment. So what we're looking at for this first year of the 2018 Farm Bill, the payments to be made here coming up in October, possibly have payment on wheat and grain sorghum, unlikely on corn and soybeans, unless county yields were significantly lower than average. And because it is county specific, you have interactive maps on the Ag Manager website that folks can go to and get a more firm idea of what those payments would likely be. And certainly as the further information on yields comes forth. Right. And so we've used the best data that we have. If we had data from RMA, uh, the Risk Management Agency, we use that because that's what FSA will be using as they determine this. They could make some adjustments uh, to that for their final numbers. If we didn't have RMA data for a county, then we use the national ag statistics data. Uh, it's the best estimate, but it's not a final estimate. So you got to be just a little careful in using that. 
Rich, as you've worked with these numbers, you get a pretty good feel for what is working and what isn't for producers as far as that choice that they've made back when on ARC or PLC. And that's coming quite clear now. It is a lot more. Uh, for those that chose PLC for uh, wheat and corn and grain sorghum, that was the right choice. Uh, ARC was the correct choice for soybeans. And so uh, for these two years, it's really looking like there will be payments for PLC and probably not for ARC for the corn, uh, grain sorghum, and, and wheat. And definitely nothing in PLC for uh, soybeans, so the ARC was the right choice on that one. They'll have another chance to make a a decision come uh, March 15th of 2021, and that will be for the following crop year. Mm -hmm. But uh, for now, PLC was the right choice. Producers, if you haven't taken advantage of those tools on the agmanager.info site, please do so because they give you a running account as best as can be determined at the moment as to what these payments will be for ARC and PLC for not only this coming fall for 2019 production, but projecting forward for the payments to be issued in 2021 for this year's production. It's all very useful. Take full advantage of that. Rich, while we have you here as well, we'd like you to fill us in on an event that you are helping coordinate, and that is the Agricultural Lenders Conference that Agricultural Economics puts on every year. But there is a change, like with everything this year. Instead of two locations, you are concentrating this get-together in one, right? We moved the normal two locations of Garden City and Manhattan to Salina, tried to be in the center part of the state so folks could access it from either direction. This is kind of an experiment. We haven't held a, an in-person meeting since COVID came along, so uh, we're hopeful that uh, we can do that. And we're also uh, going to stream it live for those that are unable to attend, but I'd sure encourage folks to uh, come in person if they're able to and and, uh, wanting to have some interaction with other folks. It's not just for ag lenders, by the way. It's uh, crop insurance agents, farmers. uh, It's open to anybody that would like to. This is set for Wednesday, September the 30th, starting that morning with registration at 830. Just a quick glimpse to what will be covered during that program. Contemporary topics of importance to the lending sector for sure, but as you say, Rich, to just about anybody involved in agriculture. And one of the new things, we have a a new faculty member, Jenny Ift, who will be looking at non-traditional finance. So there's a lot of places that uh, producers can go for uh, lending now uh, other than the traditional banking route. And so she takes a look at what that means uh, going ahead. Uh, Michael Taylor will have some stuff on land values, uh, some of it that she hasn't uh, had out before. So uh, that'll always be interesting. She does that quite a bit. We also have uh, some information on health insurance among Kansas farms. That's a big issue right now and uh, something that a lot of farmers are really struggling with, but just some Kansas Farm Management Association data that helps understand the situation there. Excellent. Robin Reed presenting that. Dan O'Brien with his grain market outlook. Alan Featherstone on agricultural trade, the long view, as he's put it, a macroeconomic update from Brian Brigham. That's comprising the program taking place on September the 30th. The Agricultural Lenders Conference put on by Kansas State University. And to register, you're the contact, Rich. I am. My email is rvl at ksu.edu. Or they could call me 785-532-1504. 785-532-1504 or rvl at ksu.edu. Rich, thanks for all of this. We'll have you back again soon. All right. Thanks much. An Extension Associate in Agricultural Economics at K-State, that's Rich Llewellyn with us. On this part of Agriculture Today. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasty meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. 
Welcome back to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Once again, in its 96th year of broadcast service to agriculture here in Kansas and the Central Plains. Eric Atkinson with you. Now today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. The environmental groups that lost that legal challenge to the Enlist DO herbicide registration by the EPA want another chance to argue their case in court. Back in August, a panel of judges in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruled two to one in favor of Enlist Duo's continued registration, with the stipulation that the EPA reevaluate that chemical's risk to monarch butterflies. Well, late on Tuesday, the plaintiffs who brought the lawsuit against the EPA, including the Center for Food Safety and the Center for Biological Diversity, filed a petition for a rehearing of that ruling in bank. That means a review by a larger panel of all 11 Ninth Circuit judges. In their original lawsuit filed back in 2017, these plaintiffs argued that the Ninth Circuit should vacate the registration of Enlist Duo, that's the premix herbicide designed for use over the top of Enlist crops. They alleged that the EPA had not followed the proper procedures to assess the risks to endangered species and the environment. Now, in their petition for rehearing, the plaintiffs restated their original claims and argued that the Ninth Circuit judges ignored established science. This petition is the plaintiff's last chance to get the case overturned at the circuit court level if their petition is denied an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court would be their sole remaining option. Now, Corteva AgriScience, the current registrant of Enlist Duo, told DTN that it is confident in the sustainability and effectiveness of the herbicide, but they are watching the case nonetheless carefully. House Agriculture Committee Chairman Colin Peterson of Minnesota says that he favors giving the USDA the authority to use Commodity Credit Corporation funds to address issues with compensating livestock producers for animals that are euthanized for reasons other than a disease outbreak. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue said he could not address the problems in the pork plants from this past spring because he only had authority to deal with animals that were sick. Peterson said he wants to provide the USDA authority to deal with disaster situations, whether it is a human pandemic, African swine fever, foot and mouth disease, or another round of avian influenza. And Peterson faulted the Trump administration efforts on the market facilitation programs one and two and the coronavirus food assistance program, saying that they, quoting here, were basically done without much consultation with Congress. Relative to CFAP, Peterson cited issues with the period of covered losses and the lack of coverage of some crops as issues with the program linked those to a failure to work, as he said, closely with Congress. The USDA yesterday detailed some federal assistance available for residents, producers, and others affected by those wildfires in the western states. Addressing the issues with wildfire mitigation, the American Farm Bureau Federation and 13 state affiliates are also asking Congress to provide additional funds and programs to help prevent and recover from catastrophic wildfires. The Federation and the states sent a letter to Senate leaders supporting the Emergency Wildfire and Public Safety Act of 2020. That bill would help mitigate future fires, but it would not address the immediate loss and damage facing farmers and ranchers. The USDA stated wildfires have burned nearly 6.9 million acres across 11 states. USDA's Forest Service has more than 7,800 people involved in fighting the fires as part of a contingent of 31,000 state, local, and federal staff combating those fires. And the Department of Grain Science and Industry here at K-State, along with the Grain Elevator and Processing Society, or JEEPS, have announced that registration is open for two in-person training programs at the IGP Institute here at the university. The hands-on training program would be an in-depth maintenance course that will give participants opportunities to learn about assembling and repairing grain conveying equipment, and the Grain Elevator Managers course gives a broad overview of the responsibilities of managing a facility. The hands-on training course, December the 1st through the 3rd, the Grain Elevator Managers course, will take place January the 19th through the 22nd. For more information on either of these, go to grains.ksu.edu slash igp. 
Now it's on to this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Here's Greg Akagi. Dan Neenan, director for the National Education Center for Agricultural Safety, joins us. And Dan, National Farm Safety and Health Week is coming up the week of September 20th. And the theme this year is Every Farmer Counts. We picked the theme this year, um, you know, and talking about, uh, you know, of course, the issue of injuries and fatalities with farmers. Um, Agriculture leads the nation in deaths per 100,000 workers and has for several years in a row. So we want folks to know that every farmer matters, and we want to try to do whatever we can to protect that farmer from injury or a fatality. And during the week of National Farm Safety and Health Week, you have daily topics of focus. Monday is uh, tractor safety and rural roadway safety. So to take a little bit of extra time, because the farmers are going to be out there with the harvest, and we'll be out there later into the evening with that. And to always be taking a look before you pass a piece of farm equipment, if there is a farmstead or a farmstead driveway off to your left, that that tractor may be turning. Unfortunately, we have several incidents per year where folks get injured and or killed because they're trying to pass the tractor when the tractor is making a turn into a farmstead. Tuesday is overall farmer health. So talking about farmer health injuries and basically your health. Wednesday is always Children's Day or youth in agriculture. Unfortunately, we average about 103 fatalities among uh, youth on our farms every year. Thursday is going to be emergency preparedness. So getting ready for what to do to prepare for, whether it be a natural disaster, whether it be an injury, what are you going to do to be ready? Fire uh, comes to mind and having a fire extinguisher. And Friday's topic is safety and health for women in ag. Women are playing more of an active role in ag, so we're starting to see the amount of, of course, women being injured in ag rising up as well. And if they go to the website, they can also see webinar presentations that will take place. Every day at lunch, and then on a couple of days, there'll be a couple extra webinars that are available no cost to them. Uh, they just need to log on to a Zoom session and uh, be able to take that webinar. What's that website address? It's www.necasag, so N-E-C-A-S-A-G dot org. That is Dan Neenan, Director for the National Education Center for Agricultural Safety. He joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Coming your way now on This Agriculture Today, our weekly time set aside to discuss horticultural matters, and in this case, the very latest on the lawn and garden insect scene. For that, as always, we turn to research and extension horticultural entomologist out of K-State, Raymond Cloyd. Raymond, quite a few new things we'll pick up on this time around, including blister beetles, When we talk of that pest, it's often in the animal agriculture realm. It's a threat to horses. But blister beetles can be active in garden settings as well. Is that correct? Absolutely, Eric. We have a series of blister beetles, the darker black blister beetle. And then most recently, what we see is the three-striped blister beetle feeding on radish and other coal crops. But yes, the black blister beetle is a really big pest on eggplant and, and, and caused some substantial damage. But recently, we've seen populations of the three-striped blister beetle feeding on radish, beets, and other plants. And like you mentioned, uh, you got to be careful handling them because they give off a substance called cantharidin. And cantharidin is a defense mechanism for them, but it can actually cause irritation to the skin. And if it gets in your eyes, it can be very problematic. So if you see blister beetles, wear leather gloves, hand pick them, squish them, or put them in some soapy water at this point. But uh, they can cause some substantial damage during this time of year. And that's that cantharidin, which can be threatening to horses, just to round out that story. But one wouldn't necessarily want to spray for these blister beetles then? 
Uh, you can spray with a common insecticide. Uh, also, if it isn't too late, these floating row covers are also effective, although you've got to make sure that the edges are secured so you don't get the adults crawling through. But when you have these populations, which I've seen uh, recently, it's a uh, hand picking is probably the most effective means of dealing with them. And they can otherwise do damage to those cool loving crops in the fall then. Yes, and the issue with blister beetles is there's the larvae do feed on grasshopper eggs, so there's a beneficial aspect of them, although the adults will feed on a, a wide diversity of vegetable crops. In fact, in our next newsletter, which will be this week or next week, I'll have an article about blister beetles. Very well. So gardeners, be aware of those. You're not quite out of the woods in as far as garden insects yet, blister beetles active. Mimosa webworms. You've mentioned this in the past. Remind us of this pest and what damage it can inflict, Raymond. I, I think this year has been the heaviest infestations I've ever seen, Eric. If you go along the streets and look at your mimosas or honey locusts and they're brown, their leaves look like somebody hit them with a blowtorch, that's mimosa webworm. It is a caterpillar, and late spring, it'll start feeding and then webbing the leaves together. Once it does that, it's pretty well uh, tolerant or resistant to any insecticides and even some natural enemies. So uh, if you do go around, if you see this, don't spray, just just hope that next year it isn't as bad. But this has been the worst year I've ever seen uh, relating mimosa webworm. And is their damage lasting on honey locust on mimosa then? Or is this a one-time circumstance? Well, like any insect that might pest, there's some cycles. I would say the honey locust will tolerate this year. But if we continue to get the levels we've had like this year, it can set them back somewhat. But, you know, nobody knows. They don't have a crystal ball to predict that. But again, uh, I'm sure people are noticing that why are my uh, mimosa and my honey locust brown right now? And that's the reason why. Golden garden spiders in vegetable gardens, flower gardens, where? Raven. We're pretty much all over, Eric. They like open, sunny areas. But this is the spider that uh, is, is big, uh, very distinct coloration, yellow abdomen, distinctly black. But when you see their webs, there's a zigzag pattern vertically, and they hang downward. And uh, what's really interesting, and I actually saw this several weeks ago, a grasshopper gets caught, the spider spins some silk around it and traps it and then uses the food source. And they're predators, but they're beautiful spiders this time of year. Uh, when we get some dew, the dew uh, hangs around the webs and really showcases it. So just enjoy these spiders out there. They are predators, but be aware that's what they are. As Raymond says, appreciate them for what they bring to the local ecosystem. In the case of your yard, the Golden Garden Spider. Need to follow back up on squash bugs in our late developing vegetables, such as the pumpkins and squash and such. Are they still out there and getting with it, Raymond? Yes, the second generation is out there right now. And you mentioned pumpkins. That's really important because the adults and the nymphs feed on pumpkins and they can cause damage that's going to distract per person from buying the pumpkin. So uh, I've seen some really heavy infestations in zucchini and, again, in pumpkins. So just be out there. You can spray with an insecticide. But remember, most of the life stages are on the leaf underside. So you got to get good coverage on the leaf underside. Uh, spraying the top will do you no good. You can hand pick, you can vacuum them up. But if you don't do anything at this point, they can cause some potential damage. All right, so don't ignore them. Although we're getting later in the season, they can still cause a problem or two this late in the going on those vine crops in your garden. Lastly here, something that we've talked about for the last few falls, the oak leaf itch mite. And of course, you've received scores of questions about this in recent years. Talk about its prospect for returning this year, Raymond. Well, we've had very few inquiries regarding the oak leaf itch mite this year, and I think the reason is because the pin oak trees were not infected by the oak leaf marginal gall folder, which serves as a food for the oak leaf itch mite. So if you're out in your yard and you see the leaves of your pin oak curling on top, the edges curling on top, uh, that's caused by the gall folder. 
and the gall folder larva are a food source for the oakley fish mite. So there are some sentinel plants that I use around Manhattan, and I have not seen it. So this seems to be a year where we're seeing less indications. Of course, 14, 15, 16 were really bad years for oakley fish mite. But remember, it, it's not going away, and next year could bring um, a different level of problems with this mite. But again, Check your pin oaks, and if they're, they don't have the leaves, edges folding over, you are in pretty good shape. If, on the other hand, you hear from a homeowner or two that the itching has, has resumed, we will know that they've at least popped up here and there. But for the here and now, the outlook good as far as the oak leaf itch might being a lesser problem this year. Raymond, we appreciate the word as always. Thanks for being along with us. Thank you, Eric. I look forward to our next visit. We'll have you back again soon. That's horticultural entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, Raymond Cloyd, on this week's horticulture segment. Well, our time's away once more. We appreciate you tuning in and hope you'll rejoin us right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.